Just before Thanksgiving Day 2005, uh, a US Marine ran into a house in a town called Haditha, which is not far from Baghdad in Iraq, and began shooting children. He later told investigators, uh, I remember they were kneeling down. Uh, I don't remember how many there were, but uh, it was a lot. And he also said, I am uh, trained to uh, use two shots to the chest and two shots to the head, and I followed my training. The uh, Marine in question had just lost a, a comrade. Uh, his friend had been uh, killed by a roadside bomb, literally blown him in half, and the team of Marines, shocked, uh, panicked, saw four men, five men, approaching in a, in a white car, a possible follow-up attack, uh, and they just went berserk. Uh, they rampaged through nearby houses. Um, they shot uh, one child. She survived by uh, playing dead. One child's grandmother, grandfather. They shot a man in a wheelchair. They shot an infant. They killed 24 civilians. And that massacre at Haditha didn't even attract a great deal of attention at the time. The situation in Iraq was so bad, it was regarded both by uh, many Iraqis and by the US Army itself as, as largely unremarkable. And if the situation in 2005 was bad, the situation in 2006 was worse. Uh, 2006 saw Iraq really, if we're honest, slide into civil war. The a uh, golden dome at the Samara Mosque was uh, destroyed at the beginning of the year. This is an, an act roughly comparable to the IRA blowing up St. Paul's Cathedral. It's significant. Um, Sunni Muslims, Shia Muslims were fighting. Uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq was a vicious uh, insurgent group. The, the situation was utter failure. And the US Army simply did not have a strategy to deal with the situation. That was why, without excusing it, that was why those Marines perhaps behaved in the way that they did. They knew the strategy they'd be given was completely failing. They were frightened. They'd lost a comrade. They had absolutely no effective response. And yet, by the summer of 2008, the situation in Iraq had completely turned around. American deaths had fallen. Iraqi deaths had fallen. There was a, a measure of political stability. Uh, almost everything that mattered had changed. And I think the question is, for, for any of us who want to understand how any really big organization that is failing badly, any of us who want to understand how such organizations change, you really couldn't ask for a more testing example than the war in Iraq. Now, one thing we've discovered is um, organizations in those situations often don't change from the top. We are very used to, we just love to think about leaders. We love to, love to analyze everything through the lens of leaders. And the narrative we tend to tell ourselves about organizational failure is, well, the leader was bad, and then he was replaced with a good leader, and uh, that, was, that was the end of the story. Now, part of that story is true in the case of the war in Iraq. Um, the bit about the bad leader. Who was in charge? Donald Rumsfeld. And <clears throat> I mean, just to... An idea about how Rumsfeld operated uh, could be got from a, a press conference that was held in Washington, D.C., um, just a couple of weeks after the Haditha massacre. And the, the facts about those killings had really scarcely begun to make their way up the chain of command. So the, the subject of the press conference was, was the wider uh, conduct of the war. And Rumsfeld was there, and so was General Peter Pace, who was the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. These are the two most senior figures in the American military. And journalists at this press conference noticed something rather strange. Given that Iraq was facing a, a really vicious, dangerous insurgency, in fact, arguably three separate insurgencies, it was pretty odd that Donald Rumsfeld wouldn't use the word insurgent. It was, it was so odd that a journalist actually challenged him uh, on this. And Rumsfeld said, well, I, I had an epiphany over Thanksgiving weekend, and I realized you know, these are people, they don't deserve the term insurgent. So we just have this bizarre Orwellian dance around the word that needed to be used to describe the situation the US Army was in, to describe the enemy they were facing. And it wasn't just Rumsfeld engaging in spin doctory. 
This had profound ramifications for the whole way the US Army uh, conducted itself and discussed its problems. So generals would visit uh, troops on the ground and say, this is not an insurgency. And the troops on the ground are thinking, well, if you would tell us what it is, that'd be awesome. You just weren't able to discuss the problems they were facing. And the interesting thing about that is, there was really a strong precedent for, for Rumsfeld's kind of absolute refusal to accept dissent um, in Vietnam. Now, Vietnam, Iraq parallels are pretty dangerous, but here's one I think works quite well. If you read um, a history written by a, the historian H.R. McMaster, it's called Dereliction of Duty, and it describes the way that uh, Lyndon Johnson and Robert McNamara failed and dragged America into the war in Vietnam. And if you want to summarize the failure in one way, it was the fact that they suppressed dissent. They refused to hear alternative views. They insisted on absolute unanimity. And we know from psychological research, this is a terrible idea. It's a very famous uh, piece of psychology, um, research conducted by the psychologist Solomon Ash. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. So Solomon Ash you know, got a bunch of young men around a table and showed them a piece of card with three lines, different lengths on, and another piece of card, which was the reference card with one line on, I would say, okay, here's the reference card, here, is, here are the three lines, A, B, C, which of the, these three lines is the same length as the reference line? And these young men, you go around the table, and the answer is obviously B. It's not complicated, it's not difficult. And the first guy would say A, and the second guy would say A, and the third guy would say A, and the fourth guy would say A, and the, the eighth guy is starting to sweat because he's looking at it and it's clearly B. He doesn't understand what's going on. He starts to crack jokes. He's, he's, he he starts talking about how his eyes must be deceiving him. And when it finally gets around to him, he also gives the wrong answer. He falls in with everybody else. Of course, Solomon and Ash had set up the experiment. All these other people are stooges. It's only the last guy who's actually being experimented on. Funny thing is, Ash repeated these experiments with somebody else dissenting. One of his other stooges also dissented. And even when the stooge got the answer wrong, that was fine. Everybody, else, everybody says it's A, this guy says it's C, this person here finally feels able to tell the truth, it's B. So dissent is very important. Even if the dissenter is wrong, mere expression of dissent helps make better decisions. And H.R. McMaster described this process of total failure going into Vietnam, and exactly the same thing was happening at the top in Iraq. Rumsfeld completely refusing to accept any alternative expression of the situation the US Army was facing. So what changed? How do you change in a situation where you've got this total suppression of dissent? Well, the answer is you need somebody uh, very smart and, and very brave. And that person, in this case, uh, is somebody, let's call him Colonel H. And Colonel H began the process of turnaround in Iraq months before the massacre at Haditha. Don Rumsfeld didn't even know it was happening. It was happening in a town called Tal Afa. And Colonel H had taken his men to Tal Afa and diagnosed the situation. He said, look, here's the basic problem. Um, we are camped in a big concrete base outside the town. We drive into the town, day tripping like tourists in hell. We ask people to tell us where the terrorists are. Uh, they don't tell us. The reason they don't tell us is because they are afraid they know they will get killed if they are seen talking to us. We drive away again. We learn nothing. And Colonel H said, we we're going to change this. We're going to try something different, despite the fact that there is no insurgency and despite the fact that this is contrary to US Army policy. I'm going to move my men into Tal Afa. I'm going to set up small bases, and we are not going to move. Now, this is a strategy of tremendous personal risk. A lot of Colonel H's men got killed. Colonel H himself, when I spoke to him, he had just had a hip replacement because of a roadside bomb. But also, it's a career risk, because the generals above him were saying, don't do this. This is not the strategy. This is not the way forward. And Colonel H just said, I'm, going to, I'm just keeping going. The pressure those men uh, were under was incredible but it actually didn't take very long for the strategy to pay off and for the locals to start saying, well, actually, that guy strapped a bomb to a mentally disabled teenager and gave her a two-year-old toddler's hand to hold and told her to walk into a line of policemen and kill all the policemen. And to be honest, you know, we're not that fond of the Americans, but there's no way we're harboring those people. Now that we know that we're safe, now that we know that you're not going anywhere, 
will cooperate. So it, it, immediately, almost immediately, Colonel H won the cooperation of the local people. And the amazing thing is, this quickly started to spread. So uh, other colonels saw what Colonel H was doing, and they, and they copied him, and they passed around you know, advice and emails, and said, just don't tell Donald Rumsfeld, just kind of, this is working. And so Colonel H's tactics started to spread, despite the fact that he was repeatedly passed over for promotion to general, because he was regarded as, as a troublemaker, somebody who wouldn't take orders. What kind of guy does this? What kind of person takes such risks with, with his career? Well, the answer is pretty simple. Colonel H was H.R. McMaster. H.R. McMaster was the historian who literally wrote the book on the failure of top-down leadership in Vietnam. And he could see it happening all over again in Iraq. And he wasn't going to let the US Army do this to itself a second time, no matter what the risk to him. Uh, there, there were some amazing communications that were passed around the, the soldiers at the time. There's a great PowerPoint presentation called How to Win the War in Al Anbar Province by Captain Trav. And it's these, these matchstick uh, figures wandering around, you know, there's Joe, he's a soldier. There's Mohammed, he's in the police. Uh, these are the bad guys. Oh no, they look like the good guys. Joe and Mohammed don't know who's who, what to do. Just explaining is a simple, simple language. In, in, and he describes what actually happened in Al Anbar province and, and how that war was won and how the local sheikhs were won over by um, the, the US Army. Captain Trav uh, explained, you, know, you need to wear a moustache because Iraqis have a really hard time trusting people without moustaches, so grow one. <laughs> Just, some of it was so simple. Captain Trav was uh, uh, Captain uh, Travis uh, Patriquin, uh, and he wore his own moustache. And he explained this wonderful happy ending where the sheikhs come along and they defeat the insurgents. Unfortunately, there's no happy ending for uh, Captain Travis Patriquin himself. Uh, just before Christmas 2006, he was killed by a roadside bomb. He left behind three children, his wife at home, and at his funeral, the local sheikhs turned out in force. These are the risks these men were taking, and they were also taking amazing risks with their careers. Now, the narrative we have of the war in Iraq is, of course, David Petraeus, General Petraeus, came in and changed the strategy. That's not really what happened. I mean, Petraeus is an amazing soldier, an extremely smart guy. But he did not change the strategy from the top down. What he did, and this is something I think is much harder and arguably more admirable, is to realize what his own colonels were doing on the front line. In fact, Petraeus sort of helped to organize his own little insurgency inside the US Army to change its behavior. He wrote a counterinsurgency manual, and he invited in all sorts of people, all sorts of differing perspective human rights experts, people from the State Department, uh, uh, British uh, officers who'd been incredibly critical of the US Army. He invited all these people in and produced this counterinsurgency manual, which was then reviewed in the New York Times and downloaded half a million times in the first month. And Petraeus got his face on the cover of uh, Newsweek, is this the man who can save Iraq? Long before he was ever promoted to being in charge of Sashi in Iraq, there's a story, by the way, Donald Rumsfeld was walking through Dublin airport, and one of his aides was running in front of him and rearranging the magazines so that Rumsfeld wouldn't have to see Petraeus' face on the cover of Newsweek, because he was so angry that Petraeus was kind of stealing his, his thunder. That was an internal insurgency. Now, of course, you could say, well, you know, if only they'd appointed Petraeus, who's a smart guy, right at the start, it, it would have been fine. He could have run it from the top down. He, he would have been like Rumsfeld, only he'd have been right instead of wrong. And I think that's a fundamental misunderstanding. Good leaders are important, but the local experimentation, the figuring out what is actually working, is equally important. There's been this fantasy in the army and in business and, and in some parts of politics as well of... I know you can call it, you can call it the, the Bond villain fantasy, the idea that you sit in front of this huge screen and, um, you know, or maybe a, a huge wall full of screens and you stroke a white cat and everything sort of plays out in front of you and you see all the strategic threats you face and you make these decisions and, and you get them all right. Um, and that is, that is a fantasy that uh, corporate executives sometimes have. You know, if we have enough slide decks, we can control what's going on. If we have enough data, we can control what's going on. 
at, on the shop floor. Uh, it's a fantasy that Rumsfeld had, the, the idea that we, we're going to pinpoint every tank, every plane, every enemy position, and we're going to run this war from the center. But in a complex environment, you cannot do that. It has to be experimentation on the ground. You should be able to look the guy in the eye and, and figure out, is this someone who's going to cooperate with me, or is this a terrorist? All the smart bombs and the drones and the helicopters and the satellite imaging in the world will not help you with that. And that's a, that's a lesson the US Army has begun to learn. It's a lesson business has learned, because now businesses are finding these amazing new technologies we have. They're not centralizing businesses. They're actually decentralizing. There's evidence that businesses are decentralizing as they acquire better and better technology. Because, I mean, I don't want to involve Hayek in a discussion of military strategy, but actually Hayek said something quite smart about this. He said, there's no substitute for the particular knowledge of time and place. And he was talking about economic decisions, but it's equally true of political decisions, it's equally true of military decisions. You've got to be there on the ground. It's a lesson the US Army should have learned in the first Gulf War. And we have this vision of the first Gulf War, if you look it up or if you remember it, amazing satellite technology and smart bombs and the generals who were fighting that war knew where everything was. If you're actually on the front line, you saw it slightly differently. There's a very famous tank battle. Tom Clancy wrote about it. The US Army writes about it in their official account of the first Gulf War. When a, a troop of, it was called Eagle Troop, a troop of nine US tanks in a sandstorm went over a, a sand dune, a huge sand dune, and suddenly realized they were outnumbered 10 to 1 by Saddam Hussein's elite Republican Guard, almost 100 Iraqi tanks and uh, personnel carri uh, carriers. They were in a sandstorm, they had no air cover, they had no warning. Nothing about that situation was working the way it was supposed to. Eagle Troop's captain instantly decided there's no way we can go back, we have to go forward, we have to attack. He made that decision like that, straight away, ordered his men to fire, and those nine US tanks, you know, very well trained uh, gunners, brilliant tanks, managed to destroy all 90 Iraqi vehicles without taking any casualties. And the whole thing took just a couple of minutes. Now, that's celebrated as a victory for the US Army. But actually, it shows there is absolutely no substitute. The generals cannot uh, help you. You, on the ground, have to make decisions. And the man who made th those decisions was H.R. McMaster, Captain H.R. McMaster. And those are the management lessons of the war in Iraq. Thank you very much.